Okay, we're going to begin. Um, here at the uh, Institute for Advanced Studies, we have a, a real pleasure of uh, sharing a building with some terrific physicists and astrophysicists and being right across the way, in fact, right next door to here, from mathematicians. And uh, uh, so in, in afternoon tea sometimes when I talk with the physicists, uh, they, make, they, they make an interesting point. They, they point out that they think biology is terrifically complex for all of the reasons everybody's seen today. The complexities are enormous and that biology is running about 100 years behind physics in its ability to really get quantitative information to the sixth, seventh, or eighth decimal place like you can from quantum theory and from relativity. Uh, and so they, they feel that the remarkable precision of quantum theory and relativity uh, have places uh, and, uh, of course, the remarkable people who have given us those theories uh, places physics about 100 years ahead of biology. Uh, but here also at the Institute is a very dynamic and interesting mathematical physicist named Freeman Dyson. Uh, and he's a bit of an iconoclast, Freeman, and, and, and he points out that he thinks biology is about 100 years ahead of physics and math. And uh, physics and uh, uh, about 100 years ahead of physics. Uh, and uh, Freeman's argument that biology actually leads physics is that uh, physics has a problem. Uh, it has two really very good theories, the theory of quantum, uh, sp the small, and the theory of relativity, the, the large, and uh, no one has really uh, succeeded in uniting them. And so one has two different theories, to, uh, we all, which work very well, uh, but to explain a common set of facts. Uh, however, uh, about 160 years ago, uh, Charles Darwin came up with a single theory of all of life and all of the life processes, which helps to explain, in fact, uh, all the things that we do. And so everything we do uh, has a common underlying single theory, which is, in fact, constantly being proved to be correct as we look at all the data that we saw today in the genome and, and so forth. And so he thinks that physics is about 100 years behind biology until they can unite their uh, two major theories into a single uh, <laughs> common field theory. So uh, I'm going to uh, continue the, the discussion of evolution because it is the common theme. And one of the reasons why I'm going to rely on evolution is because the diversity of the data sets and the diversity of the talk I'm going to give will, uh, be, will seem blurring at, at first. So let me uh, thank a bunch of people and then you'll start to see in the thanks the kind of diversity that the group works on that has in fact a common theme that I'll come back to at the end. Right, so I'm going to talk a bit about evolution, and I'm going to really continue the discussion that Mickey started on the evolution of the family of three genes, uh, P53, P63, and P73. They're hu three human orthologs. They're all transcription factors. They all have programs in transcription, and they have slightly different functions. And the work on that was uh, done by Vladimir and Prasanth and, and by Elke. Uh, and then I'm going to pick up where Mickey uh, left off because uh, uh, there's probably almost nothing as important in evolution as fecundity and f f fertility. And that is the work of Wenwei Hu, who's at the Cancer Institute in New Jersey. He's a new assistant professor. And then I'm going to talk about autism, uh, which may seem a strange thing to bring up here, but in fact has uh, some ex remarkably common features with understanding uh, mutations in cancer. And this is the work of uh, Chang and Assad, and uh, it's with the help of Dan Nodderman. And uh, I'm going to actually lead off after I give you an evolutionary introduction with stem cells. So uh, you can see that uh, I could be giving four different seminars, actually, but it, they are tied together inextricably uh, by the uh, players, by the fact that uh, genes have evolved with different functions and have played out, and it'll give us deeper and deeper insights into how these genes came about and why they came about. So let me introduce you to the family of the three sisters, as we often call them, the P53 family of proteins. Uh, in humans, the human, this is the uh, diagrammatic structure of the proteins of P53, 63, and 73. Uh, they all have a very similar transactivation domain which uh, binds all of the methylases and acetylases and deacetylases and modifies the chromatin and binds RNA polymerase. And that has about 25% identity in amino acids. Uh, they all have very similar DNA binding domains. 
with about 65% of identity and, and complete identity in the structure. Uh, they all have oligomerization domains. They're, all three of these are tetramers, and they are about 35% identity. Uh, and then P73 and P63 have an extra domain, which is a stability domain. The half-life of the protein is quite extensive, while P53's half-life is about uh, anywhere between 5 and 20 minutes. So it's a very shortly half-lived molecule. Uh, in humans, they have three related but different functions. Uh, P53 is, a, is the tumor suppressor. It is uh, a stress responder. Uh, it is important for the fidelity of the somatic genome. Right? And that's an important distinction here. It works in the soma, uh, and it ensures fidelity. So that uh, if you have a DNA break and you try to replicate broken DNA or altered DNA, what happens is you make mistakes. And those mutations accumulate, and they activate oncogenes, they inactivate tumor suppressor genes, and they lead you to cancer. Uh, that is surveilled very carefully by P53. When it sees the break, it will either allow repair of the break before replication, or it'll kill the cell. And so it is fundamentally a fidelity factor, and it's a fidelity factor in all our somatic cells. Uh, P, and that's what it does. It's probably not heavily involved in development, maybe a little bit. Uh, P63 is a stem cell uh, transcription factor for skin. So it actually, uh, it, during development, makes all of our epithelial layers, both on our skin, uh, externally, and in the esophagus. It also is important for bone uh, uh, formation, and uh, it is therefore a developmental factor, transcription factor. P73 plays a role in the development of the central nervous system and the immune system. Okay, so we have three sisters that have evolved from a common ancestor that have moved off in other directions, except I have left out that P63 and P73 also surveil the fidelity of the female germline. So uh, much like P53 surveils fidelity in the soma, P63 and 73, in mice at least, and we think in humans, will surveil the fidelity of germline transmission of information in exactly the same way P53 does, especially P73, probably. Right? So uh, they have some common features and some different features. Now, the, uh, the ancestor genes, this is the one from Drosophila, this is the one from the worm, from Xenorhabditis. The ancestor genes have DNA binding domains that are 25 and 15% identical, right? So that's 600 million years, 500, 600 million years, uh, there's 25% identity to the DNA binding domains, but even more interestingly, uh, the, those DNA binding domains bind to exactly the same DNA sequence the human transcription factor binds to. And what the function for Drosophila and the function for the worm is, is they surveil the fidelity of the germline. So that sounds a lot like P63 and 73. It surveils the fidelity of eggs. If you irradiate a female fly, the eggs undergo apoptosis in a DMP53-dependent fashion, which is really, these two genes are really much more closely related in their structure and their amino acid sequence to a common ancestor of P63 and 73. So it looks like the invertebrate gene is a P63, P73 common ancestor, and stress of any kind, DNA damage, for example, will activate these, and you'll get apoptosis of the eggs. Uh, the same thing happens in the worm in a most remarkable way. If you starve the worm for food, so it gets no bacteria to eat, it will not lay eggs because the eggs are undergoing apoptosis in response to a signal of a lack of glucose, metabolic stress. And the apoptosis is done by this CEP1, which is a P63, P73 ancestor. Uh, this actually goes back a billion years. Uh, the, the oldest organism that has been seen to have a P53 is the sea anemone, and the sea anemone has it in germ cells, and the germ cells undergo apoptosis after UV irradiation, DNA damage. Right? So the, actually, this function of fidelity in response to stress is preserved for a billion years, and that's because in evolution, that's an important function. Stress is one of the things that all living organisms have to be able to handle so they don't make mistakes under those stresses, right? They don't make errors in fidelity. And these, this is the family that has been in charge of that for a billion years, 
of evolution. Now, uh, things begin to change. So we have an ancestral protein in the invertebrates, which is P6373-like, and things begin to change in the, the uh, chondrogenous fish, that is the fish with cartilage, that's sharks, skates, rays, right? When a, a, a second gene appears for the first time, and the second gene is clearly P53. And then in the osteoastheichthys, which are the bony fish, uh, the uh, two other genes split off, P63 and 73, and that's why they're more closely related to each other than they are to P53, because this is, this is the fish vertebrate line developing, and then three genes in humans are, are, are what we see. Now, there's an interesting coincidence in the evolution here, because right around the formation of vertebrate fish, uh, the strategy of our body plants began to change from invertebrates to vertebrates. And what changed is the, the ubiquitous use of pluripotent stem cells. That is, stem cells to rejuvenate ourselves, not once per generation like a germline, but stem cells to rejuvenate our bodies every day. So today, in everybody in the audience, a billion new cells have been born. And they're in your bone marrow, they're in your skin, they're in your intestine. And that's all done by stem cells, which rejuvenate you all the time. Right? In fact, one theory of aging is that your stem cell population runs down and you don't rejuvenate yourself, and then you fatigue out. Right? That's a, a theory, a hypothesis. But the, uh, stem cells arise in this compartment for the first time. And uh, I, would, I was going to postulate something, because then I'm going to show you some evidence for it, that the reason for the selection pressure to pull off P53 as a somatic fidelity factor is the appearance of stem cells in these fish. They make bone marrow for the first, they have bone marrow, they make blood for the first time, they make scales, they put on new scales. If you cut the tail off one of these fish, they'll regenerate it. They have lots of stem cell activity, and P53 is the guardian of those somatic stem cells, it's not germline stem cells, and it will evolve rapidly, you'll see, Right? I'll show you data for that, evolve into a stem cell fidelity factor from a germline fidelity factor that it was. Right? Now I'm going to suggest that happened uh, because of these data. So uh, here are the fish down here. These are four um, bony fish, zebrafish, fugu, tetradon, sickleback. This is all from genome projects which have given us the sequence of all these genes. And here's P53, 73, 63. And uh, zero means there's no mutations, and, uh, and human is the base, right? Uh, so if you look at the zebrafish, fugu, and tetrodon, uh, there are very few mutational changes that have occurred in P63 as skin starts to form. And as we move into frogs, amphibians, chickens, or mammals, it is, it is finished making major changes. It's making skin, it's making epithelial layers, it's a stem cell factor, and it's the guardian of the female germline as it was. A P73 is somewhere in the middle here. It has a number of changes that sort of quiet down. It is making portion of your brain. It's, it's, it's monitoring the immune system, right? Playing a big role in development. And it's the guardian of the female genome as well. The real change is in P53 because it's being adapted from the ancestor gene that was a guardian of the germline to a guardian of the soma and taking up new residence in senescence and cell cycle arrest and in the somatic cells of the body and undergoes a very large number of changes in evolution through the primates, right, uh, into us. No difference between chimp and us, right? Now, um, I bring up stem cells because this summer a remarkable set of experiments were published in Nature. Uh, five different research laboratories uh, suggested that P53, that, that which watches over our somatic stem cells, right? P53 plays an important role in enforcing epigenetic marks. Now, I don't have to define epigenetic marks. We spent the whole morning listening to different groups talk about epigenetic phenomenon. And uh, the experiment that begins three, four years ago with Tanaka and his colleagues in Japan where a fibroblastic cell is taken from a mouse and four transcription factors are put in by, by transfection, cDNAs, into the fibroblastic cell. CMYK, KLF4, OCT4, and SOX2. These four transcription factors will, over a three-week period, 
uh, transform a normal fibroblast, a well-differentiated cell, into a pluri-induced, it's called induced, pluripotent stem cell. And this induced pluripotent stem cell, if put into a mouse, will make many tissues of the mouse. Right? So you really have taken a differentiated cell back to a stem cell with these four transcription factors. Right? Two of them are oncogenes. That's the problem with the process of creating these stem cells. But nonetheless, these four right, do it. It takes about three weeks in cell culture. And what's really bad is the efficiency is about 0.1%. So 99.9% .9 of the cells don't make it for one reason or another, and about 0.1% become stem cells, induced pluripotent stem cells. Well, what these five papers this summer showed was that if you take out P53, right, you can leave out MYC and KLF4, you can just put in OX4 and SOX2, right, and then with an efficiency of 80%, you will change a fibroblast into an induced pluripotent stem cell. So an 800-fold increase in efficiency. And what happens when you take a differentiated cell and make it a stem cell is you change the epigenetic marks on these cells. Their, their pluripotent potential is to go in any direction they, they can go in. And it's both the histone code that we saw in, in Ben's talk and the methylated DNA that we heard in, in Andy's talk right, this morning. Uh, are the epigenetic marks that must be acted upon in some way, right? And this led to a hypothesis, right, that P53 was monitoring the efficiency of epigenetic change, right? So I'm going to I'm going to coin a, a term because in the P53 world we live with these coined terms. We've often called P53 the guardian of the genome, somatic genome, and the reason is it prevents mutation. It kills cells with mutation. I'm going to suggest P53 is also the guardian of the epigenome. It ensures the stability of epigenetic changes. Obviously, the last thing you want is for all of your cells to drift in their epigenetic code and become stem cells, and your whole body would come and turn into stem cells. Right? You want to have some stability in your epigenome. And this, the absence of P53 and the large increase in efficiency suggested the hypothesis that P53 surveils epigenetic changes, right? Okay, now there is a quite an interesting relationship of that with cancer, right? Because uh, in, the, in the last three to four years, the cancer field has fallen in love with cancer stem cells, right? Uh, they define cancer stem cells as the ability to make a tumor in an animal, and they show that if you dilute cells enough, you can't make a tumor with too few cells. So a few cells are stem cell-like, I think, in the tumor, and that could make a tumor. And then they not only reproduce themselves, which is what stem cells do, but they differentiate into tumor cells, which are not propagating very fast or efficiently. And stem cells have, therefore, eternal growth, unlike the rest of the tumor, and stem cells are resistant to chemotherapy. Those are the two properties of these cancer stem cells, right? Now, it's axiomatic, if you watch that literature, that you know there are more reviews written on stem cells than there are papers that demonstrate there are stem cells. So it's very hard to define a cancer stem cell. Right? But we have a sort of notion about what it is. It can make a, a tumor in, a, in an animal. Right? Uh, so we made the hypothesis that those tumors which have P53 mutations could drift back into a stem cell-like epigenetic state and be truly called stem cells. Why? Because the efficiency with which epigenetic changes is monitored would be gone in a P53 mutation. And those cells that had wild-type P53, those breast tumors with wild-type P53, for example, would be tumors which would have a differentiated out, uh, microarray mRNA profile, right? So we had, a, we had uh, to test this idea, and we, we had the wonderful advantage of just going to the web and getting everybody's data sets on microarrays for breast cancer, for example. We did also lung cancer, I'll show you the data for. But when we did that, we got everybody's breast cancer data sets. We also needed to know who had P53 mutations and who didn't. And there are two data sets that had sequenced all the tumors for P53 mutations. So we had sequenced P53 mutations and microarray data sets. And then the one thing more we needed was, how do we tell that this is a stem cell? Right? And here we really had a big advantage. Turns out there's a journal called Stem Cells. Right? And in that journal, there's an article published in, in 2007 that reviews 43 different microarrays that have been done 
that, that profile the genes that are important to be on and off in embryonic stem cells. Right? So you can get a signature, if you will, much exactly like the signature that Annalise told us about for breast cancers. You can get a signature of genes which are typical, if you will, a signature of genes typical for this. And this is, this is the work largely of Hideaki in our, our group. Uh, and he, he derived a signature. Now, a signature can have lots of different uh, number of genes. This, it could have one gene, it could have a thousand genes or two thousand genes. And everything I'm going to tell you is independent of the number of genes we use. Right? So picking, we're not picking anything. We could look at, uh, we could look at 1,076 genes and get a signature. 380 genes to get a signature, 95 genes to get a signature, and everything I show you would be true for any of those three signatures, right? So that, that really helps validate that we have an embryonic signature. And then I'm going to show you the microarrays that we used, right? So the first one is 251 breast cancers from Miller et al., right? And they have grade, they have P53 mutation in black here, and we overlaid predicted P53 in activation by the genes they were expressing. So th there is a, a, a microarray signal that you can use, a signature or a feature that you can use, which shows the P53 genes, regulated genes, and when they're inactivated, they're over across this region. Right? And uh, when you're red, you are like a stem cell, and when you're blue, you are like a differentiated cell. Right? And so uh, here's grade, one, two, and three, high grade. Here are the P53 mutations. Most are in high grade, and that was a common observation that was known. Here are the predicted inactivations. One of the reasons to have predicted inactivations is there's more ways to inactivate P53 than just mutation. Right? So here are the predicted ones, and here's the red. Right? The great majority of, of, the, of the stem cell, of the embryonic stem cell profile, without any proliferation genes, are over the P53 mutations. Now, you see red where you don't have P53 mutations, and I presume that's, uh, that's a stem cell, but it's an inefficiently produced stem cell because you don't see the cluster, right? And you see occasionally a P53 mutation in lower grade, so it's not grade that's important, but it's red, right? Uh, here's the confirmation of that. This is 80 breast cancers from Langerod et al., right? Here's the grade again. Here's P53 mutations. Here's the embryonic stem cell signature, right? And here's again, right? So what this says is for breast cancer, uh, this, this marker, a profile or a signature of transcription of embryonic stem cells, that marker, right, follows P53 mutations more than anything else. It would be consistent with the hypothesis that in the absence of P53, the epigenome can move around. It has a higher probability of changing and the change in the epigenome gives rise to a transcriptional profile that's a signature of stem cells. Now, it, we looked at lung tumors because they had the ability to tell us about P53 mutations. And I should say that we got pretty good statistical evidence that the red followed the tumors, right? But there were many exceptions, and there are more exceptions in lung tumor than there are in breast, right? So it's a weaker argument in lung, but it's a pretty strong argument in breast tumors that P53 is surveilling this epigenetic change. Now, uh, there are a number of things you can do. Uh, this is exactly the same three data sets. And here's what I've showed you before, embryonic stem cells. This is the signature for induced pluripotent stem cells. Those are not quite the same as embryonic, but look at that. It follows it quite nicely. This is the signature for polycomb. Polycomb is a complex of DNA methylation, uh, of DNA, of RNA, sorry, of histone methylation, histone acetylation, deacetylation. So polycomb is 603 genes, which are all in making epigenetic programs and giving rise to differentiated cells. And it's the reciprocal red of the P53 mutations. And here are the P53 regulated genes. They're all in the reciprocal form. Again, you just see the same thing all over again. Right, for these, and in lung, it's not as clear because there are many more exceptions, right, as it is in, in breast. But it's still a pretty good p-value for the first two, right? Not so, so as good for the last two, right? So uh, the conclusion here is there's a good correlation.
between P53 surveillance of epigenetic changes and stem cell appearance, right? And the loss of P53 allows that. Now, uh, Annalise showed you uh, this. This is her classification. It's done with the Miller data, right? Normal like luminal A, luminal B, HER2, basal. We, uh, she, and she also showed you that almost all of the basal ones have P53 mutations. The HER2 news can, and some of the luminal Bs can with time. And look at that. Here are all the reds. Here are the less reds for this. Here's the induced, and there's some more here. Here's the reciprocal, right? So uh, normal like luminal A, right? And, and uh, are very well differentiated here. This is a more neutral luminal B, but it's quite clear that basal like in HER2. The same thing happens in the second data set, right? And the same thing happens in a different class. There's a, other classifications that have come up. There are medullary and metablastic tumors, met metaplastic tumors, which are known de-differentiated tumors in this classification, and they have all the stem cell characters, and they have the p53 mutations. Right? So uh, these data, uh, this is just uh, as Annalise showed. Uh, this is a, a, a survival curve. This is a. Kaplan-Meier plot of five years, 10 years, 15 years survival for breast cancers. This is the Uppsala breast cancer cohort that I showed you. Uh, and here in red are induced pluripotent stem cell and uh, embryonic stem cell. So survival's terrible for stem cell. Survival's better if you're the other type, and it's in the middle if you're just IPS. Right? And the same thing is true with the Nagoya lung cancers. If you have stem cell, survival's bad. It's in between for IPS, induced pluripotent stem cell, and it's better if you're more differentiated uh, product, right? So it, we really start to see the exact same thing, but we can put new names on it and we can get an associated tumor and we can put a new interpretation on what it is that's making this stem cell uh, phenotype, right? Now, um, I want to go back. Uh, oh, I'll just finish up with uh, an experiment that Wen Wei Hu did. Uh, the, uh, if this is correct, that uh, in the absence of P53, you do get drift in epigenetic markings and therefore in development, uh, how would you ever have a knockout mouse with P53? Uh, if that was a very severe phenotype, the mouse should be quite a mess. It should be just filled with stem cells, right? And, and it actually does have a lot, has more stem cells actually than, in fact, a, a, a mouse with P53. In fact, uh, Jeff Wall and his colleagues have shown that mice that have uh, about three halves the amount of P53, one and a half times the normal amount of P53, have less stem cells. They, and he, you can do that by transplantation of the bone marrow, right? And mice that have half the number of stem, uh, P53 alleles have more stem cells, right? So there is some correlation between the amount of P53 and stem cells in P53 has haploinsufficient phenotypes. Uh, so Wen Wei Hu decided that she would take P53 wild type mice and P53 null mice, and she would sequence by parasequencing a portion of the genome which is known to have imprinted methylation. Right? Uh, an imprinted methylation is an epigenetic mark. And uh, as Shirley Tillman uh, here, just across the way at Princeton, had shown originally, uh, the IGF2, insulinite growth factor, protein 2, which is the major growth factor for an embryo, and H19 genes are alternatively imprinted. If H19 is expressed, IGF2 is turned off. If IGF2 is expressed, H19 is turned off. And this is associated with methylation of 24 CPG residues between the two genes. And so she took the region between the two genes and did pyrosequencing. And for the wild type, for eight wild types, you get that the, the males and the females have slightly different ratios. Uh, you get the, the, um, the in this case, the, the males are the dots and the females are the triangles. Right? And in this case, you, but you get a, a fairly constant amount of methylation at about 40 to 45 percent. And for many of the nulls, there's a little bit more variance, right? But for many of the nulls, you, you don't see much change. But for the nulls with birth defects, you can see dramatic changes in the methylation pattern. And so this would say that it is more consistent, right? You're, you're able to have epigenetic changes occur at a higher frequency, right, in P53 null mice. And in this case, they're associated with birth defects when they happen. 
And P53 null mice have a, a, a fair number of birth defects. In this case, they're runted, they are born with their brains outside the uh, cranium, exencephaly, and, and, and so forth. And they have altered marks in the, in the DNA. Okay. Now, um, I'm going to return to the evolution of P53 in humans, and I'm going to show some data that is related to what Mickey was talking about. These are the HapMap data for HapMap number three. Right? And this is, it's looking at the P53 gene, the P63 gene, the P73 gene. It looks at it in, in this uh, version in three racial groups, African from the Yoruba tribe in Nigeria, Caucasians that actually come from Utah right now, and Chinese that actually come from San Francisco right now. Right? And the sample sizes are, are 113 and 84, and you just have to double this to get the number of chromosomes. And then the number of, of single nucleotide polymorphisms across the gene, as Mickey showed you, right, is shown here. It's, they look at between seven and nine across the gene. Uh, and then you assemble those into haplotypes because, uh, uh, and, and you do that by maximum likelihood calculations. And the reason is that you, while you look at each of the seven polymorphisms, you don't know what strand they're on, so you don't know really their haplotype, but their frequency uh, can tell you and guide you into what the haplotype is. And you can look at, therefore, the maximum number of haplotypes. Uh, you get, here you got 15 haplotypes, 10 and 11 haplotypes. And then you get something called the haplotype diversity index, which is one, if it's 1.0 or 0 0.99, means that there's not really an inhibition of recombination between alleles, right? That, that, that they're completely mixed up, so all haplotypes are possible between alleles that are across the gene, right? And, and, and that's useful information, because when it does what P53 did, it tells you something about selection. Uh, in, in Africans, there's a restriction in the number of haplotypes that have been seen uh, to about 15% below what's maximal. Uh, in Caucasians, it's about 50%. So half of the possible haplotypes are not in the population. Right? And here, at, in, in Asians, uh, it's, uh, in fact, in Japanese, it's the same. So Asians, it's about 25% of the haplotypes are not present. Right? And this is a real tip-off that this gene is under selection. Right? Why? Uh, very recently, Mickey put it at 30,000 years ago, but it could be between 30 and 50,000 years ago. That's recent in evolution. Very recently, a change happened. It was the, what he told you, was the proline to arginine change. And then it got selected in Caucasian and Asian populations. And because it got selected, it swept along all of the alleles that were closest to it, and the number of haplotypes diminished. So if it's positively under selection and you lose haplotypes, it's because something arose at a time and it's sweep, swept into the population and has kept all the other alleles the same. We haven't had time to recombine them out yet. It's only 30,000 years. And so this haplotype diversity being reduced is a tip-off that there's positive selection happening. And the gene that was under positive selection, as he told you, was the P53 gene where proline was the ancestral gene and arginine populated the Caucasian and Asian populations and reduced the haplotype frequency because arginine was swept into the population. So in Scandinavia, for example, 85% of people are carrying the arginine. Uh, the allele frequency is 85% in arginine. In Africa, it's 98% proline. <laughs> right? That's the ancestor. And, and the reason why there's now no difference in, as you'll see in a minute, in fecundity between Africans and, and, and Scandinavians is that genetic background is important. He showed you that there were other alleles that balanced this out. So genetic background is important. Right? But this is the allele. And this is the, the traditional, this is what Mickey showed you. Uh, these are all the different stresses, DNA damage, hypoxia, uh, nutritional deprivation, spindle damage, infectious diseases, nutritional deprivation, heat shock, cold shock, all activate P53, and then it kills by apoptosis or senescence, or hold cells in cycle arrest, right? And as I told you that there was a gentleman named Van Hemst who looked at over 12,000 people in Sweden, right? All the age 75 to 85, and asked the question, what was the frequency with which they had proline and arginine? And most of them 
or arginine. And he asked about the frequency of cancers over those 10 years. And the frequency was about threefold higher if you have proline alleles than if you have arginine alleles. So the arginine allele is a stronger allele to protect you, right? Now, uh, it would be nice to think that just having the arginine allele would be terrific and you'd be lucky if you had it, except that if you look at the death rates of people between 75 and 85, uh, those with the arginine allele, the stronger allele, died at an earlier age than those with the proline allele, even though those with the proline allele were getting cancer at a higher rate. Right? Okay. Now, everything in life is a trade-off, and I've already given you the hypothesis that he made. He said, okay, uh, if you have the arginine allele, you have a stronger allele, but it protects your stem cells so efficiently that you lose your stem cells faster with life, right? And so you have fewer stem cells at the age of 75 if you're an arginine allele than proline, and you will die at a younger age. You don't rejuvenate yourself as well, right? That's a hypothesis, but it at least is consistent with all of the data, right? Now, this, once this became apparent, and I have to say this came upon us largely because Mickey has very good instincts about selection and, and, and these kinds of, <laughs> of facts were, be, were becoming clear that this gene was under positive selection, uh, we were perplexed about it. And we were perplexed because cancer is not under positive selection or negative selection. And the experiment Van Hems did was at the age of 75, right? Nobody's reproducing at the age of 75. Having the arginine allele is no big advantage after 75 in an evolutionary sense, right? And that really, we then sat down and began to debate what was it that P53 was doing? What is it that it did to protect, to, to be involved in an evolutionary selection, right? And it was my technician who came up with, Zangie Tereski who came up with the answer. She said the following. Did you know that when we have, this is male and female mice, when we have knockout mice, right, that means no P53 in the males and the females, the litter sizes are very small of these mice. And, and we said, no, we didn't know that because all, we, we never go to the animal facilities, we just order the mice and you just give us the mice. And so we never count the number of offspring, but she had records that went back 10, 15, 20 years. And here are her records, right? Uh, for a C57 black mouse, the crosses of wild type on the average give limited sizes of 6 or 6.7 and fertility rates of 100%. That means everyone in the cage gets pregnant, right? Uh, if you knock out the male P53 but not the female, it doesn't change, right? But if you now knock out the male and the female, it goes down tenfold and fertility rate goes down fourfold. If you give wild type male and no, minus minus female, it goes from 6.7 to 2.1 with a fertility rate of 36%. Something was surveilling the female fertility right here. Right? And as Mickey told you, I can show you <coughs> very nicely what happens. Uh, in the uterus of these mice, uh, P53 is actually activated and is present, but at the fourth day after conception. So, D0 is the day of conception. This is the, a section of the uterus, right? Uh, anyway, you see these dark stains, it's due to the P53. This is the, immuno, uh, uh, the immunohistochemistry of it. Day one, day two, day three, day four. Day four is the day of implantation. P53 is maximum. Day, day five, day seven, day nine, right? day 13. So at implantation, P53 is made in the uterus and P53 makes LIF, which is the hormone that's absolutely required for implantation, right? And this is the slide he showed you. This is the uterus, wild type, eight. Eight implantation sites on the average. In the knockout, on the average, 2.7. P53 knockout plus a LIF injection, the hormone replaces the phenotype, right? So the phenotype can be completely replaced by that hormone. And so we were very satisfied that P53 was doing this. And in fact, when you inject LIF here, you get birth defects, right? So you're bypassing, the P, you're bypassing P53's surveillance of birth defects, right? It's actually surveilling development as well as surveilling for cancer. And it's just being reused to watch for the same sets of problems, right? Now, we were getting ready to write this up for Nature. And uh, this paper came out. 
It's by Kulam, who runs an in vitro fertilization clinic in Chicago. P53 tumor suppressor gene associated polymorphisms with recurrent implantation failure. That's exactly what Wenwei had found in mice. Right? Codon 72, proline frequencies enhanced in 205 women with recurrent pregnancy loss in an IVF clinic due to recurrent implantation failure. Right? That's the SNP. That's the arginine proline SNP playing a role in humans. Right? And here we've just repeated her data. Just, this is from the New York Clinic. Right? Uh, this, is, this is the work with Zev Rosenwax. Arginine proline in New York City, the frequency is 77% arginine, 22% proline. If you're under the age of 35 in the IVF clinic, the frequency goes from 77 to 64, from proline from 22 to 35. The enrichment of the minor allele right, has a very strong p-value, and it shows that that plays a role. And in fact, as Mickey showed, a large number of other proteins in the complex, the protein complex, play a role in the SNPs. What surprised us here, though, was that was not true for women over the age of 35. Look at this. P-values go to insignificant effects, right? It was only true for women under the age of 35. And when we went back to the IVF clinic and asked why, what, what was happening at the age of 35, they said, oh, between 35 and 40, we have a different problem. The problem isn't an implantation problem. The problem is the quality of the eggs. With age, the quality of eggs deteriorates. And the way we solve the problem is we go to a, a college woman and ask her to donate eggs. Well, she doesn't quite donate it. She gets paid for donating eggs. And those eggs that she donates get fertilized and implanted in the mother, the surrogate mother, which is now the real mother, right? And uh, which has the real father. And uh, you solve this problem a different way, right? Well, that just rang a bell for us. Aging, if you think of aging as a stress, and anybody over a certain age will, if you think of aging as a stress, what's happening is your reproductive capabilities are declining and SNPs thought to come in. And who watches over the germline genome but P63 and P73? Who watches over the female germline genome? So Wenwei did an experiment. She took this, I'll just show you P73, but P63 actually has a very similar result. P73 SNP, right? This is, this is one of the SNPs Mickey was showing that is under selective pressure, right? right? Here's, here's a, a SNP. It has a, a frequency in the population, percentage frequency. In young people, the frequency Coming to the IVF clinic doesn't change at all. There's no statistical significance. But if you're over the age of 35, the frequency goes from 41 to 33 and from 58 to 66, an enrichment of this frequency, right? And so what one can see is as a function of age, P73 starts to play a role in the germline in humans, right? Now I'm just going to finish up pretty quickly by showing you that you can go anywhere you want once you're talking about reproduction and look for mutations or look for events that are happening. So here's the hypothesis we have based on Wenwei's work, right? Uh, autism is a disease that's caused by mutations in the offspring. Parents don't have autism. They don't have those mutations. So what's happening is they would have a SNP in P73, right? Which is a maternal effect SNP, right? It makes P73 poorer at making, at transcribing genes that repair DNA. And it does so during meiosis, right? That's the hypothesis. It does so during meiosis. That means if you have this SNP, you have a higher chance of passing along mutations to your offspring. Mutations in your offspring could be in tumor suppressor genes, in which case you would get cancer at a young age. It could be in genes of the central nervous system in which case you could have autism or schizophrenia or a number of other disorders that you see in these families, right? And so this is perfectly general, and that's why we go to the autism database, because we've got the P73 SNP here, right, which is at a frequency of 3.7% in the population. And fathers have it at a frequency of 3.7% in the autism data set, but mothers have it at a 5.7% frequency in the data set. Well, male and female don't have different frequencies of SNPs unless it's an ascertainment bias. It's an ascertainment bias because we collected in this data set women who had children that had autism, right? They had higher mutation rate. It would be a prediction. Now, we can't measure mutation rate because we haven't sequenced the DNA, but we can measure recombination rate from the SNP chips we have, so we measure in the mothers. 
on the average in the control the, the, for, the, for the homozygous A allele, capital allele, 44 recombinations. In the father, 27 recombination events. This is about what is known in the population to be average. It goes up to 54 in the mother, goes up to 59 in the mother, stays at about 27 here, right? Same thing is true for topoisomerase 3, right? It's enhanced in mothers, in frequency, and fathers, actually. And the recombination is enhanced here, right? Same thing is true, I'm just going to run through these fast. I'll make a common feature of them. Genes called MRE11, MAD1, right? These are all DNA repair genes. These are, so the, the genes that are giving scores of being enriched in mothers or fathers and having offspring which have higher rates of autism, right, or mutation or recombination is the phenotype here, are because they're not repairing the DNA properly. They're leaving breaks. You leave breaks, you get higher rates of autism. You get higher rates of recombination. You get copy number variations at higher rates. Uh, the last set of genes, P53 binding protein 1, which is a protein that binds to P73. This is in fathers, right? has a high rate, actually, and watch the recombination rate in fathers, right? homozygous rates. Right? Uh, RAD51, that's another repair gene, and I'll just finish with this, which is the complex that repairs single and double-stranded breaks. Right? RAD50, MRE11, right? uh, P53, BP1, right? all of the RAD50, right? All of these genes that repair DNA breaks start to show up. And in this case, these are maternal effect genes. These are genes that affect male and female meiosis, and they just make more mistakes, more recombination events. They don't repair the breaks as efficiently. And especially with age, right, this becomes a problem. And so it, the stress here is aging. And the SNPs, which are, are inferior at DNA repair, right? That's what the, these SNPs are all about. These SNPs, which are inferior at DNA repair, have a consequence on the offspring, right? And, and so this is, this is exactly the same mechanism that we said existed one billion years before, right? <laughs> Except in the germ cells of, of C anemone, right? Surveillance of the fidelity of the germline, right? Because these, and the reason P73 is involved, is that MRE11 and BRCA2 and RAD51 are all genes transcribed by P73. Right? They are, it's a DNA repair pathway of transcription. Right? So um, what this says is that if you want to uncover new tumor suppressor genes, you don't, you don't have to look in families that have lots of cancers. What you have to do is look for these SNPs in the parents and then look for people who have had cancer at a young age as a consequence of that. And they will have copy number variations, which you can find out by sequencing, that will uncover new tumor suppressor genes. Right? And we're just doing that in, in, in a, a study. We've got a study of three generations now of women with breast cancer, right? the Framingham study. And it has all of the data in it. And we're just getting our IRB permissions now to do that. Thank you very much. I'd be more than happy to. Uh... Oh, I should. I just want to show you a sea anemone. That's the that's the parent of us all. <laughs> yes. One. I'll take one question because I'm running late and we ought to. Yes. If, say again, I'm not sure. Basically, if you think about lung cancer as an environmental cancer versus sort of a natural cancer, if you split out smoker versus the natural cancer, you know, random casting. Yeah. 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 So you can, you can see the P53 system in lung cancer very well. And the reason is the following. Uh, if I'm, I'm just going to give you the odds ratio of developing lung cancer if you have these SNPs, right? The one Mickey showed especially, right? Um, if you have the GG SNP, that is the SNP 309 of MDM2, the odds ratio is 1.6. If you have the ODGE Pro, the odds ratio is 1.4. Right? If you have both, the odds ratio is 4. So that's MDM2 and P53 SNP. If you have both and you're a smoker, the odds ratio is 10. Right? So you can see the environmental impact on the background of the genetic SNPs. 
Oh, the, in the stem cell phenotype, we have, not, we have no genotypes on MDM2, and all we have is the microarrays and a sequenced P53. So we have no genotypes on any of the other uh, group. We, we, sh we should actually, if you notice what Annalise was doing, she's collecting genotypes and she's collecting transcripts. So someday we're going to have that database where we could put it all together. Yes, one last question and then... Oh, yes. Um, I should have mentioned that. But, so in Israel, they did a study which demonstrated that age of father was an important variable. It went up, frequency of autism goes up as age of father. And they just recently published the second study saying age of mother, right? So that's the reason why we went to the autism database, in point of fact, is there's a very good correlation of that. There is, of course, Down syndrome. There are a number of other things. MAD1 Mad which is one of these genes is a segregation gene. And, and so it probably is all involved in a very similar set of fidelity over mistakes. And, and the SNPs are having an impact of that. 